Welcome to In the Spotlight. I'm Abigail Pogrebin. Josh Lambert is Associate Professor of Jewish Studies and English and Director of the Jewish Studies Program at Wellesley College. His books include Unclean Lips, Obscenity, Jews and American Culture, and he co-edited How Yiddish Changed America and How America Changed Yiddish. He's written recently for the New York Times Book Review, Jewish Currents, Literary Hub, and Lilith. He serves as a judge for the Sammy Rohr Prize for Jewish Literature. And his newest book, which we'll talk about today, is called The Literary Mafia, Jews, Publishing, and Postwar American Literature. Welcome to the broadcast, Josh. It's so great to have you. Oh my God, thank you, Abby, for doing this. It's, a, it's so much fun to talk about this book. And full disclosure, I think we should just admit that we are both judges on the Sammy Rohr Literary Prize, uh, which has been a pleasure to sit with you, but we have our own kind of little mafia going on, the two of us. I mean, and that look, I have to say, before we talk about the book, that's like what made me want to write this book is that so often we know the people that we're, you know, like that we're interacting with that do us favors, that help us out. So, you know, it, it's it's such an extra pleasure to like get to talk about this with someone who I've like served in that role with. What I love that you did, Josh, in the acknowledgments and what you just did here is kind of call out the ways in which this book actually came about, which is that kind of one relationship led you to another relationship led you to ultimately do this book. But let's just start with the idea for it. What gave you uh, the notion that this was uncharted territory um, on the page? Well, I think that a lot of people who read, you know, you know, who are like readers who enjoy books might be familiar with at least vaguely with the sense that like a lot of the big publishing companies that you've heard of were founded by Jewish families, Random House, Simon & Schuster, um, you know, the Ferris Strauss, you know, so many others, Knopf, so many that you can name um, come from these like have these Jewish stories behind them. But it's not something we talk about a lot. And really, the starting point for the project was just just to get into that and say, ask the question, like, why does it matter what influence or effect did it have that some of the biggest publishing companies and most important ones were founded by Jewish families? And what is this term Jewish mafia? Uh, how would you define it? And I know we have to be careful because it is. I mean, I'll ask you, is it a, a term of anti-Semites? <laughs> um, is it a term that even Jews began to embrace? Yeah. So when I started to look, you know, for who was talking about the fact that publishing companies were started by Jewish families, really like the first thing that that floated to the surface was people like Truman Capote saying American publishing is controlled by this nefarious group of Jewish people who are helping each other out in this really unscrupulous way. And he called it, you know, the literary mafia. What's incredible is you see not just anti-Semitic, you know, I think when Truman Capote said it, it sort of comes off as pretty anti-Semitic. Um, but you see Jewish writers like Meyer Levin um, use the same term. And I think that it's a way that people had for, for just expressing the fact that when you work in publishing or when you're a novelist, you're gonna see a lot of Jewish people in places of influence and power. And I think that's obviously not a bad thing. I mean, I'm a Jewish studies scholar. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And I think that if you think there's a problem with Jewish people having any kind of power and culture, well, you're getting pretty close to anti-Semitism. I wanna just read that Truman Capote quote completely because it's just, it's pretty shocking, honestly, um, and you have it in the book. The Jewish Mafia in American Letters is a clique of New York-oriented writers and critics who control much of the literary scene through the influence of the quarterlies and intellectual magazines. All these publications are Jewish-dominated, and this particular coterie employs them to make or break writers by advancing or withholding attention. So was this actually a conviction that there was kind of these marionette strings um, that Jewish editors and publishers were holding that kept some writers out or brought them kind of into the club? Uh, it's certainly something that someone like Truman Capote felt. And I think other writers who, for whatever reason, weren't having the best time of it, felt like something unfair was going on. Um, whether they were Jewish or not, they could point to people who had it easier than them or who were getting more attention than them and they could complain about it in that way. Other people, you know, I, I talk a little bit in the book about people inside the publishing industry who just amazingly to me and hilariously to me um, felt like 
own, like Jewish people were responsible for buying most of the books in America, uh, like editors, like real serious people, editors at publishing houses, people who work for Publishers Weekly would say like, Jews buy something like 70% of all hardcover books in America. And I and I think our good friend Carolyn Hessel in, in some of her, you know, who works at the Jewish Book Council would even say things like that. And I had heard Jews it- Jews buy that. books, Jews buy books. <laughs> Jews buy books, they buy all the hardcover books. At one point I did the math and tried to figure out what it would mean if Jews actually bought 50% of all the hardcover books in America. And like, it works out that every single Jewish person in the country would have to buy like 2000 books every wow. year to like make that number make sense. I want you to first explain, Josh, to some people who don't know the industry, why are you mentioning hardcover as distinct? Cause I mean, I, there is a difference. So I don't think hardcover books are that important to think about in this case it's just that when we think about the economics of publishing the most many of the most prominent important books that are published and the sort of make or break point for a lot of books is their hardcover sales so i think that when some when i like i have someone saying that jews buy they're more them, expensive they're, yeah, more, they're expensive. more expensive and they're and they're really the first usually the first edition of a book that people do yeah and when they do well they keep them in hardcover longer a publisher keeps it in hardcover as long as possible if yeah, and sells. frankly, you make a lot more money off a hardcover if it sells really well. If you if you can if right. you can have a success with it, yeah. But you're saying that's one of the canards is that Jews buy hardcover books, and if if the reality was played out, it it doesn't actually even make sense. Yeah, no, exactly. Like, there's no there's no mathematical way that like Jews can be responsible for buying half of all the books in America. That like there's just not enough Jews, and there's too many books. What is part of the, I, I know you really walk a careful line here to talk about what is true about whether there is a literary Jewish mafia, but let's just talk about the reality of how many Jews were in this business and why that happened, because I think your history there is so interesting. Can you kind of give us an encapsulated version? Right. I think like we want to resist any sort of anti-Semitic notions about Jews like colluding, but the history is actually a really like wonderful one in which um, uh, you know, as I said uh, a minute ago, so many of the publishing companies that we'd look to as admirable, as celebrated, like, you know, Random House, which is now basically the biggest publishing company in the world. These were founded by young Jewish men and mostly men and uh, in some cases women who really loved literature, cared about it, wanted to get into this business. Most of them came from fairly wealthy backgrounds and had family money that they could invest in the business. And that's how we get companies like Simon & Schuster and Knopf. Um, and as you uh, move through the 20th century, you see that um, Jews do extremely well and really are um, very influential and very successful in American publishing. Um, you know, many of the editors that we'd point to as like the most dynamic and most interesting um, literary editors of the 20th century were Jewish people. And I think that they founded some of the the magazines and some of the publishers that we still look to like today if you're a writer if you're me or you like you'd love to have knopf want to publish your book you'd love to publish your work in the new york review of books these are like still very um important and valuable literary institutions that were founded by you know in in many cases in most cases and by groups of jewish people and can you name a, a few others just so people are reminded of just kind of where the spots where this is true. We, I mean, oh, we sure. I mean, there's, I mean, there's, there's really so many um, places. You know, some of the, some of the ones that I discuss, um, or that I'm interested in, like uh, a guy, a guy like Jason Epstein, who had a, just an incredible career as an editor, who, um, as a young man, basically innovated in the field in creating like trade paperbacks. So most of the books behind me, most of the books in most people's libraries are trade paperbacks. It was a format that American publishers weren't using and that he more or less like popularized. He went on to an incredible career at Random House, um, publishing, you know, uh, publishing books like Portnoy's Complaint and, and other like, you know, hugely successful books. Um, so like that's a, you know, that's an interesting example. Um, but I think like in so many areas of literary culture, you can see um, Jews having succeeded in this way. Like another interesting example I don't talk about a lot in the book is like the Book of the Month Club, um, which was an incredibly successful like marketing program for books in America. Um, 
you know, uh, I spent a lot of time in the book on Knopf because it's such a good example of a company founded by a Jewish guy, Alfred Knopf, and his wife, Blanche Knopf, and they worked with his dad. And they, you know, they for many years had um, not an entirely Jewish staff, but lots of their editors in chief and, and like sort of leading editors were Jewish people. And so it was a great company to like examine the choices they made and the kinds of books they did publish and the kinds of books that they didn't publish. And, and one of the things that was interesting is that they were these, a lot of these early books were turning Yiddish, or they were translating Yiddish and making Yiddish kind of a European like sort of romance language almost. Can you explain yeah. that a bit? Yeah, I know. One of the things I was interested was precisely to ask the question of like, what kind of Jewish books did these presses like to publish? And one of the important findings, right, one of the most important reasons that there isn't a real literary mafia is that different Jewish editors like different things, right? Like any editor you look at is going to have their own taste. So what I found is that um, at Knopf in like the, especially in like the 30s and 40s, um, they had some real successes with uh, books translated from Yiddish. And the way they positioned them was as great European literature. So they would say, you know, uh, if you like War and Peace, if you like Thomas Mann, you can read I.J. Singer. And that's obviously like true in a way, right? Those, a lot of um, the great uh, 20th century Yiddish novels have that huge, uh, that like expansive canvas and that sense of like a family story that makes sense to talk about them as a Yiddish novel. What the, that those same editors were not at all interested in like Yiddish stories from the Lower East Side about like Jews working in sweatshops. That wasn't particularly like compelling to them. Well, that was one of the other things I was gonna follow up on when it comes to Knopf is that it was interesting to me that he or their team were not so interested in Jewish American stories. Yeah, I, th I think that you'd, you'd sort of assume or maybe guess that uh, an American Jewish publisher would want to tell the stories of, you know, what life had been like for Jews living in America. But it was actually astonishing how I really couldn't find almost any examples uh, of Knopf until like much later, until probably the 60s or 70s, where they would do a book about Jewish life in America. And it just it. it it reflected the way that they think about, they thought about like what made uh, Jewishness interesting in a literary way. They wanted to see it as like part of a great European culture. You call the uh, post-war period in literature a time of Jewish literary enfranchisement, enfranchisement. Can you explain what you mean by that? Yeah, I mean, I, even when I talk casually, I might use words like power or influence. And I think that if you've spent time um, talking to Jews and about Jews, you know that those are like freighted words. Like it, we're, it's a little bit complicated to even say the word power or say the word influence. And when I was working on the book, I thought um, I was trying to think about what term would make sense to describe what happened to Jews as they overcame discrimination and sort of like gained a presence in the publishing industry. And I like the term enfranchisement because when we talk about like someone getting enfranchised, like someone getting the vote, we know that they were just like being denied the vote and that getting a chance to vote doesn't mean, doesn't tell you what they're going to vote for. It doesn't tell you like what they're going to choose or how, or, or it doesn't even like, it doesn't even mean they will vote. It just means that they're not anymore being denied the opportunity to participate. And what you see in the 19, in the 1890s and the 1910s, um, when, when there's a sort of like peak of anti-Semitic discrimination is really that sense of like, it, this is just not something a Jew's allowed to do. And, and, and they're sort of kept fully out of the business. Because I think that one, one of the things that gets lost is, is that again, Jews were not welcome in so many places, including in this area. And that, so this is in some ways, some might say, might think an overcorrection, but in some ways it's actually a balancing of the scales. Yeah, in, in, in a way you could, you could think of it in that sense that like part of the reason it was noticeable that there were so many Jews was that there had been a time in recent memory when there were no Jews, when Jews were kept out effectively. So like without that, you know, no one complains about the Protestant mafia in American publishing because there were always Protestants and there always will be. But I think that that it was that history of discrimination that sort of made it interesting. You mentioned Truman Capote, but also Jack Kerouac was complaining, Flannery O'Connor, and they're watching their Jewish peers like Philip Roth, Saul Bellow, Cynthia Ozick, 
kind of get more attention, I guess, is the is the thing. What, what, what Was there a turn where suddenly there was kind of a, a, a groundswell of this belief? And, and how seriously was it taken? You know, it's really hard with something as like socially unacceptable as this belief. I'm amazed I found um, like it written down as often as I did. Um, you know, I, it's amazing to me. I love, uh, I, I didn't, I don't have a picture of it in the book, but Meyer Levin took out a, an ad in the New York times, like a half page ad saying, you know, like a literary mafia is controlling your choice of books. So when the fact that people said it is interesting to me, but for the most part, it's like really hard to measure how widespread a belief it was, because I think it's the kind of thing that people whispered about. And it's the kind of thing that people said to each other in private. Um, I did find some private letters where people were joking about it. Right. And I think it was a widespread enough belief that if you could get in a time machine and go back to 1970, basically anybody you talk to in publishing would have been able to have an opinion of it. But um, you know, the, I, the, the, the most extensive source that I have on it, which I really, it, I just love as a fascinating book is this book by Richard Costellanitz from 1974 called the end of intelligent writing, which is the most extensive. And like, it is a huge book of 450 pages, naming names, detailing, like who was working with who and who was helping who. And it's, wow. you know, that is like the most extensive. Um, and just because we, we sort of got that garbled, it's the end yeah. of intelligent writing. The end of intelligent, uh, the end of intelligent writing. Yeah. Wow. Um, you talk about nepotism or you touch on it. And, and I just want to let's just focus for a second on the Epsteins and the fact that they were married and they were both so powerful. Can you just give us a snapshot of them? Sure. Yeah. So um, Jason Epstein, I mentioned earlier, was this Random House editor, you know, incredibly uh, influential editor. Um, he was married for a while to Barbara Epstein, who was a founding editor of the New York Review of Books and went on to edit it for many decades. And they were talked about at the time in the 70s, in the 80s, as um, an incredible power couple um, in publishing, Re really two of the most um, you know, just the, the most, uh, powerfully positioned people in the business. And what was their criticism of the fact that they were married or at least suspicions, I guess, that there was kind of one hand was feeding the other. Right. So what some writers at the time, um, in the, in the early seventies looked into is they looked at the advertising pages in the New York review of books. And they, they showed that random house advertised something like twice or three times as much as any other publisher and that random house books were getting reviewed twice or three times as much as any other books in the new york review of books so the the suggestion was made you have these two people they go home and have dinner together whether or not they're actively colluding this is a conflict of interest that like should be paid attention to because it wouldn't be fair if these two companies which are so powerful in different ways in the publishing business are you know um colluding with each other and I love that you found Barbara's uh, letter on behalf of her son, was it? Can you tell us just a little bit about that moment? I mean, I think it's just such it's such a powerful story about, you know, what happened with their son, Jacob, in terms of like how it works out to have the, those kind of roles in the culture. So um, when I don't you know, I've never met him or interviewed him, but by all accounts, he was their son. Jacob was like a precocious and excellent writer um, when he was 17 years old. His mom uh, writes a letter to the editor of the Times Literary Supplement in London and basically says, my kid is like, you know, traveling around Europe. He's supposed to go to Yale and start there. But like maybe instead you could give him a job as an editor at your, you know, very prestigious publication. And she writes like as a Jewish mother, I'd appreciate anything you can do, which is, I mean, just amazing. And I'm sure she's like partly joking, um, but, you know, in a way you can understand i mean as a as a parent myself like you can understand you help out your kids you if you can write that letter if you can get them an internship you do it and i don't really like i i i try not to be too judgmental of people for doing that because i think that um you know while there are line ethical lines you can cross obviously i think for the most part it's very understandable people want to help out their kids of course the the punchline of that story is that their son this kid jacob epstein goes on to publish a novel that's like very successful and sells lots of copies and is 
widely praised. And then it turns out he plagiarized it from Martin Amis, who writes like very charmingly about how this kid has stolen his work. Um, and, you know, it's hard to read that as anything uh, it, for me. It's hard for me to read it without thinking that it's um, at least in part uh, and maybe unconsciously Jacob's revenge on his parents for giving him too many opportunities for like making it too easy for him. It's so interesting. Uh, I want you to just touch on the, the women question, the particular focus on how women were treated in this industry and why you chose to take uh, a, a whole chapter uh, to look at it. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the other major changes that happens in American publishing, right? If you look at American publishing in the 1920s or 1930s, another thing you'll notice is that like no women are allowed to work at all in any positions of power. And if you look at American publishing now, um, while there are still some problems, like surveys show American publishing being about like 80% female, something like that. So that's a huge change. And probably there's a whole book or many other books to write just about like, how women get into publishing and, and all the complexities of that. Um, but as I looked at it, I was curious whether Jewish women, you know, had any advantages or, you know, how that transition to, to getting those kind of jobs happened for them. And what I found immediately was that so many of the women um, who did get editorial roles in the 50s and 60s and did start to like have sort of very, you know, very powerful jobs in the business were married to other people working in the business, like had to have had relationships. It seems like part of what was necessary for them is that they had to have like some sort of connection to a man who was powerful in the business. And so that was interesting enough to think about like the comp the complexities of that, because you have all these like, you know, very sort of uh, unpleasant stories of, you know, someone like Midge Dector um, being called in print Mrs. Norman Pithoritz, right? Like not being like given the sort of autonomy or respect that an individual woman writer obviously deserves. But the other part of it is that in a system in which women are depending on men to like for their advancement in the business, you see a lot of obviously sexual harassment and abuse. And what was fascinating to me in like going back to read novels where women talked about the publishing industry was how frank and forthright they had been about the really awful treatment they had received at the hands of like lecherous male editors. Oh. I know you're cognizant of those who would say you are now giving anti-Semites more fodder by even posing the idea that there might be a Jewish literary mafia that was or is operating. and. I love that your response is essentially, uh, I'm not going to avoid the truth or the, uh, an academic pursuit because of what anti-Semites might do with it. But can you give a, a sense, I guess, of your rejoinder to those who are concerned? Yeah, so this is absolutely, it's sort of become, I think, my thing as a scholar because the last book that I wrote was about obscenity and that's something that anti-Semites love to talk about, which is Jews and, and their you know involvement in obscenity. And that last book, which was you know a very serious academic book, David Duke tweeted about it. And I know like white supremacists and white nationalists like use it for their purposes. So I'm very aware of that those people are out there and they're dangerous and pernicious and it's scary. But at the same time, like they shouldn't get to decide what we talk about and they shouldn't, they, they can't be given um, the power to decide what kinds of Jewish stories we tell. And I think it would just be a real shame if especially people who love literature and care about the history of American literature didn't know and pay attention to the fact that like many brilliant, hardworking Jews like contributed to the development of this field. And I think that not only do we need to talk about that, but we need to talk about the advantages that Jews have gotten and, and the um, the wonderful ways in which very often like Jews have helped out other Jewish people. And like there's nothing wrong with that and there's nothing to be ashamed uh, about in terms of like Jew Jews caring about what happens with other Jews or wanting to support Jewish writers. Um, and I think that anyone who would say that someone from from a minority group shouldn't be allowed to sort of help out other people from that minority group, you know, is is really um, denying people the kind of expression that's so important and, and necessary. And speaking of minority groups, one of your, uh, I think, real takeaways is how important it is that other minorities 
have essentially their own literary mafias. You even say, we, you argue that we, we need more literary mafias. Can you explain what you mean by that? Yeah, I think the best way I can explain what I'm trying to get at there is that it's very easy to say that like the solution to like historical racism in American culture in a particular industry is that we just need to be objective and like pick the best person for the job and like not, you know, yeah, just 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 not like pay attention to what people's backgrounds are. And I think the problem with that is that um, actually one of the benefits of being part of a minority group is that you can have solidarity. You can like help out other people from that group. And often what happens when people say, oh, no, no, let's not pay attention to, you know, like, let, let's let's just be objective is they're denying people from groups that have suffered discrimination the chance to sort of benefit from their group status. So I think that like we need to find a way in American publishing to allow the people who've been excluded. And the sad fact is like a lot of people uh, of many different from many different backgrounds have been excluded from having those jobs like those same studies of the demographics of American publishing say that the publishing industry is about 80 percent white for an industry that serves all of America. Um, and it just seems that um, if we want to see real diversity in the industry, what we need to do is not make people from minority backgrounds feel like they can't help out other people from the same background or or really like approach the work that they want to do from in any way that they want. Right. Like, I think we would never say to a Jewish editor, I know that no Jewish editor would ever want to be told you can only do Jewish books or you can only do this kind of book or you can only work on this kind of stuff. And we should, by the same token, never say to someone from any background like, oh, you can only do books of this kind or you can only like work in this area. That would just that seems really wrong. And it, unfortunately, it seems like it's what happens a lot. And just to personalize it, because you obviously have a big position at a very prestigious university, you mentor students, you teach them. How do you see your role personally coming out of what you learned during this book as to what you might do to kind of change the landscape? I think about it a lot of, of I feel very lucky to have a position where I could help a student. And I think that it is the role of people like me, if you can write recommendations or recommend people for internships to think about who's had those opportunities in the past and who hasn't, who will have an easier time of it. So at Wellesley, where I teach, there's a real uh, push towards like getting more opportunities for first generation college students who have a much harder time um, for people from, um, you know, many different kinds of backgrounds that even 20 or 30 or 40 years ago would not have been at a college like this. So, you know, I, I try, I'm, I'm sure I could do much, much more, but I really try to look out for students like that. And if I have a connection to someone who wants to hire a student or an internship opportunity, I really want to try to just be thoughtful about who I'm, who I'm um, giving those opportunities to when I, when I have the chance to do it. Well, final question, Josh, you write, it's an error to think about the history of American publishing and not think about the Jewishness of these people who are able to succeed in it. Uh, I see how often we sometimes squirm or feel uncomfortable if we get too close to the line of Jewish hubris. Um, but I also appreciate that sometimes we need to actually acknowledge where Jews have made a mark and changed things grown things, founded things, built things. How do you just talk about even permission to kind of focus on the Jewishness here? Yeah, I think it's it's funny that there's some things that we're more than happy to sort of talk about Jews doing and some other things that feel uncomfortable. But I think that, you know, like to take one small example that I mentioned in the book, right? African-American literature as a field benefited enormously from like the hard work and care of Jewish editors. Jewish editors worked very hard. And in some cases when Protestant or other white editors would not do it to like get black writers the opportunity to share their work and express themselves and to bring attention to that. And I think that, you know, there's there's really like there, there, are, there might be many cases of like Jewish editors publishing stuff that we find gross or weird or bad, but I think that we should absolutely be looking back at the history of American publishing and looking for the cases in which um, uh, Jewishness might have played played a role and, and changed that history. And I think we should look forward to like a period in which other groups get to, to play that same kind of role. 
Josh Lambert, thank you for talking to me today. The book is The Literary Mafia, Jews, Publishing, and Post-War American Literature. It will get you talking. Thanks for tuning in, and I will see you next time on In the Spotlight. I'm Abby Pogrubin. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, Post Office Box 360, Stamford, Connecticut, 06904. Or you can call the JBS Pledge Line at 833-MY-JBS-TV. That's 833-695-2788. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. We thank you for your kind support.